Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to press that like and subscribe button below. Please comment if there's any content that you'd like to see me cover. On this video, I will be doing part two of the skin and wound care video that I did last week. This week will be the completion of it. So let's just jump right into it. The first question. Which of the following statements shows the greatest understanding of wound staging? One, an ulcer must involve broken skin in order to be staged. Two, a wound that contains sloth is difficult to stage. Three, this wound can't be staged until it's debrided. Or four, the healthcare provider will need to stage the ulcer. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And guys, the correct answer is three. This wound can't be staged until it's debrided. Why? Because it's not until that wound is debrided, you can actually see how deep that wound goes. And remember, the deepness, that's what lets you know what stage that wound is. Remember in uh, part one of the skin and wound care video, I taught you the difference of stage one versus two versus three versus four. Make sure you go back and watch if you don't know what that is, but you won't be able to stage a wound until you actually debride it and see how deep it goes. Now I want to go over these other choices with you. One said an ulcer must involve broken skin in order for, uh, in order to be staged. Well, we know that's incorrect, right? What's stage one, right? Stage one is when that um, skin is non-blanchable. It's reddened and when you press on it, it's supposed to blanch, but it doesn't, right? That's your stage one. So let's look at choice number two so we know one was wrong. Choice number two, a wound that contains sloth is difficult to stage. That's wrong. A wound that contains sloth is impossible to stage. Why? Because like I said, you have to be able to see clearly, you have to be able to see how uh, deep that wound goes in order to stage it. That's why you have to debride the wound. And your last choice for was the healthcare provider will need to stage the ulcer. In what world? That's what you do as the registered nurse, okay? you can stage that ulcer, not the healthcare provider. The healthcare provider doesn't have to do that. That's the RN's responsibility, okay? Next question. Granulated tissue is best described as one, soft, yellow, and stringy. Two, black, hard, and necrotic. Three, red, moist, and vascular rich. Four, yellow, spongy, and sinewy. I have no idea what that word sinewy means, but I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, red, moist, and vascular rich. When you see that word vascular, I want you to think of vessels. I want you to think of, of bloody. I want you to think of what? Um, circulation. So that's good. When it looks like that, what number three is showing, it shows that the wound's healing. There's circulation. It's red. It's moist and it's vascular. Our other choices, choice number one says soft, yellow, and um, stringy. That's what sloth looks like, right? Remember, that's what we have to actually remove to see what that wound actually looks like in order to stage the wound, okay? So no, one, that's what sloth looks like. You need to remove that to be able to even stage the wound. Then you have two black, hard, and necrotic. That's what's known as the ischar. Um, that also has to be removed in order to stage a wound to really see how deep it goes, okay? And number four, yellow, spongy, and sinewy. I don't I have no idea what sinewy, I've never seen that word before. I need to look it up. So one of you guys, I know you remind me, remind me in the comment section. I'll look that up and I'll let you know. I've never even seen that word before. But the correct answer is three, red, moist, and vascular. That's what the wound is supposed to look like. It lets you know that that wound is healing. It's getting blood. And remember, blood is what's carrying the oxygen, vitamins, and nutrients for that wound to heal. Next question. A cognitively impaired client spends hours a day involuntarily wringing her hands. Which of the client's interventions is most therapeutic as a means of minimizing the client's risk for friction damage to her hands? One, placing thin cotton mitts on her hands. Two, frequently distracting her with conversation. 
Three, regularly reminding her to stop wringing her hands. Four, getting a prescription to minimize the compulsive behavior. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is one, giving them a uh, mitten. Now, I know some, many of you guys haven't done psych yet, so I'll just kind of explain this to you. These patients that have um, these compulsive disorders, they're driven to do whatever the disorder is. For this patient, it's constantly wringing their hands. They constantly have to do it. They feel driven to do it. So guess what? You're not going to be able to distract them. Okay. But let's, I want to go back to the question and look at what the question said. It says what intervention is going to be most therapeutic to minimize their risk for friction. Okay. You are not going to be able to distract that patient enough. That patient's going to be wringing their hands. So what can you do to protect their hands from all that friction? So the skin doesn't break down. Put mittens on their hands. So guess what? They're going to keep doing this. They're not going to stop. But when they're doing this, they're not having friction on their hands. It's friction against what? The mittens. Okay? So you're be, you're able to keep that patient's um, dermatologic integrity, right? While later, you know, we can deal with those um, compulsions that the patient has. But to keep that uh, skin from breaking down, you're going to put the mittens on their hands. Let's look at the other choices. You have two... Well, we went over two, um, two already. We know why two's wrong. Three, regularly reminding the patient to stop. No, that's not going to work. I'm telling you right now, when they have those compulsions, they are driven to do what those compulsions are. And then you have choice four, getting a prescription <laughs> to minimize the compulsive behavior. No. No, um, what you're gonna do, you're gonna give them mittens and while they have mittens and they're doing their compulsion, they're gonna go to therapy and they're gonna work on those compulsions so they can understand why they have those compulsions, which is usually due to what? Anxiety, which is usually, um, usually fear. You know, I'll, I'll talk about the other stuff when we get to site, but the point is while they're constantly doing this and they have the mittens on, they'll be getting therapy for it. Okay. So just meds and diversion, uh, trying to distract them. That's not going to work. You're trying to protect their skin integrity and that's how you're going to do it. Okay. Next question. When changing the soiled linen on the bed of a client who's comatose, the nurse notices a redden blanchable area approximately two centers in diameter on her left buttocks. The nurse's initial skin breakdown intervention is to one, position the client on the right side, two, finish providing fresh dry linen to the client's bed, three, include a two hour turning schedule in the client's care plan, four, measure the area in order to describe it in the nurse's notes. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is one. The very first thing you want to do is turn that patient. Remember, the reason that they're having that reddened area is because of all that pressure that is on the area. So the first thing you want to do is relieve that pressure, right? It kind of keeps that same concept I told you. Something's offending the patient. So for example, if a patient's getting an IV infusion and it's harming them, the first thing you want to do is what? Stop the infusion. Whatever is harming the patient, you want to stop that first before you do anything else. Okay? So the first thing you're going to want to do is turn the patient on the other side. Get the pressure off of that patient. You see all the other choices? All the other choices are wonderful. And yes, you do want to do that for the patient. But the very first priority is to stop what's offending the patient. So yes, you wanna give them dry linen because we know one of the reasons patients have skin breakdown is because of maceration due to moisture. So yes, we wanna give them dry linen. Yes, we wanna keep them at least turning every two hours. And yes, we wanna measure the area so we can describe it. But remember, it's always patient before paperwork, okay? So if you ever have to choose two choices between documenting and doing something for the patient, it's gonna be doing something for the patient. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is stop what's offending the patient. In this instance, it's the pressure off the area. You want to take the press, uh, pressure off of that area. And then choices two, three, and four you want to do. Wonderful. But your priority is stop what is offending that patient. Next question. Which of the following statements made by the nurse shows the greatest insight into the need to manage risk factors that contribute to the formation of a pressure ulcer? One, 
Her diet needs to include more protein and less sugary foods. Two, she, she needs to be moved more gently and with attention to her skin. Three, we need to decrease the time she spends with the weight on her body resting on her hip. Four, the urinary incontinency makes the risk for developing a pressure ulcer so much greater for her. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And guys, I hope you chose three. Three is the best answer. I just talked to you guys about that. We need to decrease the time she spends with weight on her body resting on her hip. Why? You want to take pressure off of those bony prominences such as the hip, such as the coccyx, such as the heels. Okay? You want to take pressure off. Now, let's talk about the other good choices. Two is a good choice. She needs to be moved more gently and with more attention to her skin. Absolutely. And that is a nursing intervention for um, patients with pressure ulcers. But the number one thing to do to reduce um, the, the risk factor for pressure ulcer is to make sure that there's no pressure on that site, right? So two is a good choice, but not as good as three. Let's look at choice number four. Urinary inc incontinency makes the risk for developing pressure ulcer so much greater for her. That's true. That's a good answer, but it's not as good as number three. And I talked about this in depth in my first video about skin and wound care, right? The number one thing is what? It's keeping pressure off the site. So even choice, even though choice two and three are great choices, three, um, uh, excuse me, even though two and four are great choices, choice three is the best because that's the one that talks about keeping pressure off the site. Number one, you should have gotten rid of immediately. Number one, her diet needs to include more protein and less sugary foods. That answer choice is great for um, uh, wound healing. If the patient has a wound, and doesn't have to even be a pressure ulcer, that, that type of wound, any type of wound a patient has, right? Protein, vitamin C is good for wound healing, right? And you want to decrease the sugar because what loves sugar environments? Bacteria. So choice number one is a great answer for wounds, but not pressure ulcers, which is what we were talking about in this question. Next question. The primary reason an older adult client is more likely to develop a pressure ulcer on the elbow as compared to a middle adult client, middle age client, is one, a reduced skin elasticity is common in the older adult. Two, the attachment between the epidermis and dermis is weaker. Three, the older client has less sub-Q padding on the elbows. Or four, Older adults have a poor diet that increases the risk for ulcers. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three. The older adult has less sub -Q padding on the elbows. I just talked to you guys about this. We want to keep pressure off sites, especially what? The bony prominences. And patients who are elderly, they tend to be more frail, okay? So they're... Um, their bony prominences tend to be more. Why? Because they don't have enough, not enough, but they don't have as much fat, subcutaneous fat, also known as padding. They don't have enough padding, as much padding, I should say, as a regular middle-aged adult does, right? I'm a regular aged, middle-aged adult. I got plenty of padding. I have plenty of padding here, here, everywhere, right? But the older adult, they lose their sense of thirst. They really don't drink as much. They really don't eat as much. Um, so their sub-Q fat becomes a lot less. So they have a lot more bony prominences. So imagine an older adult with way more bony prominences with pressure on a site. They're going to be more at risk to get um, a pressure ulcer than somebody else who has more cushion. Next question. To reduce pressure points that may lead to pressure ulcers, the nurse should, one, position the client directly on the trochanter when sidelining. Two, use a donut device for the client when sitting up. 
three, elevate the head of the bed as little as possible. Four, massage over the bony prominences. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is three, elevate the head of the bed as little as possible. I talked about this in the first video. The reason you want the head of the bed elevated as little as possible, because when the head of the bed is elevated high, you have a 90 degree angle or even slightly lower, what happens that patient just keeps sliding down and that friction does what? It can open up the skin, right? And before you know the patient got as um, ulcer, um, they might have a pressure one. So that's your correct answer. I want to go over the other choices. Number one, position the client directly on the trochanto and sideline. If I have talked to you guys about anything in this video, it's been what? No pressure on bony prominences. So you are not going to put this patient to lie down directly on the trochanto, which is what? A bony prominence. Absolutely not. So we're going to get rid of that. Choice two, use a donut device for the client when sitting up. No. Why? That's going to decrease the blood supply to that area. So you're absolutely not going to do that. So we throw that out as a choice. And then you have four, massage. You do not massage over bony prominences. Ever, 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 ever. What do you think that massage is? That massage is what? Pressure. So that you massaging that bony prominence is the same thing as applying pressure on that bony prominence, which is something you never want to do, okay? So the correct answer is elevate the head of the bed as little as possible. I feel like I did this question with you guys already. I'm going to put this on the side. Next question. The initial nursing intervention for the assessment of external hemorrhaging is one, close monitoring of the wound dressing for bloody drainage, two, frequent assessment of the client's blood pressure, three, monitoring the client's heart rate, or four, redressing of the wound. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. I hope you guys all chose one, close monitoring of the wound dressing for bloody drainage. Let's go back to the question. It said, what is the initial? What is the first intervention for assessment of external hemorrhage? So what is the first thing you're going to do when you're assessing a patient that you suspect is bleeding out? Remember, assessment is anything that gathers um, information, whether it's doing a physical exam on a patient, whether it's asking a patient or family questions, whether it's going into the chart, anything that gives you information is a form of assessment. So if you suspect that a patient's bleeding out externally, if you suspect that they're bleeding out, what is the first thing you're gonna do as assessment? Look, eyeball the patient. The answer is one, close monitoring of the wound dressing for bloody drainage. Easy peasy. Look at that wound. Do you see blood dripping out? Look at the other choices. Two, frequent assessment of the client's uh, blood pressure. That's a wonderful answer. You're going to do frequent assessments of their blood pressure because guess what? If a patient's bleeding out, that blood pressure is going to go down, right? But the first thing you want to do, why would you overlook just looking at the wound and take the patient's blood pressure? So number one is the correct answer. We're going to get rid of number two. By the way, taking their blood pressure, that's also not only external, that lets you know if the patient's bleeding internally as well. Number three, monitor their heart rate. Yes, you want to do that because when a patient's bleeding out, the blood pressure goes down and the heart rate does what? Go up because the heart's trying to compensate for that blood loss. So yeah, you want to check their heart rate, but the first thing you're going to do is what? Look, look at the patient. Remember, we go from least invasive to most invasive. And the fourth choice, redressing of the wound. Redressing of the wound is great. You put pressure on it. You, you can help control the bleeding, but that's not assessment. It's not going to give you any information. You want to look. And so the correct answer is number one. Next question. The nurse is assessing a 78-year-old female African-American client with dark skin. When assessing the skin, the nurse knows to avoid which source of light because it can cast a bluish hue on the skin, making the assessment difficult. One, natural su sunlight. Two, halogen light. Three, fluorescent light. Four, incandescent, in I can never say this word. Incandescent light, I think I said that right. 
So I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer. I'll give you a hint. It's not four. <coughs> Excuse me. So the correct answer, guys, is three. And so you do need to know this for patients who have darker skin. Um, they've got a little bit more melanin, right? We want to stay away from the fluorescent light because it just kind of gives them um, a bluish in bluish hue and kind of make makes it more hard to assess all right so um the natural light we like the halogen light is fine the incandescent light i gotta look that i don't even know what that is i know one and two are um fine but three the fluorescent light you definitely want to stay away from because it gives a bluish hue so we really it's hard for you to tell on that patient is the bluish hue coming from the light or are they really um, not getting enough ox oxygen and they have that bluish look to them? Next question. Which of the following clients is most at risk for developing a pressure ulcer? One, a three-year-old in Bucks traction. Two, a 33-year-old comatose patient. Three, 76-year-old who had a mouth stroke or four, a 38-year-old infant in an oxygen hood. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer and I expect you all to get this one right. So the correct answer is two, the comatose patient. Because remember, if they're comatose, they can't what? Move, right? So you have pressure that's constantly on their body right the three-year-old that's in bucks traction bucks traction that's the type of skin traction so the three so they're in, able to move a little bit right this is skin traction they got on right it's not skeletal traction then um, choice three is a 76 year old who had a mild stroke it was a mild stroke it didn't say that the patient was completely debilitated that they couldn't move but we know if a comatose patient if patients comatose they're debilitated they're not moving at all and then we have choice four the infant in an oxygen hood. It doesn't say anything about the infant being debilitated, so they're still able to move. The correct answer is the comatose patient. Why? Any patient that is unable to move and take pressure off of different sites of their body are at high risk for pressure ulcers. And guys, I think that was about, maybe about 13 questions. Those were the last questions I had to cover for skin and wound integrity. Um, I hope you guys found it helpful. I saw a couple comments asking me for more questions. So here are your questions. If that's not enough, please let me know in the comments and I'll try to find some more wound care questions to cover for you. Guys, thank you so much um, for spending this time with me and practicing these questions. I hope that I was helpful to you. If there are any um, questions that you have or any content that you want to, me to cover, please be sure to leave a, a comment. Please don't forget my next review is going to be August 29th through the 30th. Information for that can be found on my website at www.nexusnursinginstitute.com. And of course, please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.